Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the last of four custom coded workflow action workshops. Um, we're going to wait a few more minutes to let the room fill up. But uh, for those that you, uh, for those of you are, are, are here now, my name is Jack Coldrick. My pronouns are he and him. For anyone with any visual impairment, I am a white, uh, middle-aged uh, male wearing a green hoodie. And uh, I'm a member of the pre-sales team, uh, the, the solutions engineering team here at HubSpot. And I've worked very, very closely with the operations hub uh, product uh, over the last few months. And off the back of that, I wanted to give something back to the community and, and, and really help to educate the community and people that are interested in technology and up, upskilling on, on the, the coding side of things, help them to understand how they can use custom coded workflow actions, which is a feature of Operations Hub. Um, and we have run three sessions to date. Uh, this is the fourth and the last one of February. Um, and they've been a, a huge success and many thanks for the people that, that have joined. Uh, we've had some great feedback, some brilliant engagement. And um, yeah, I, I, Thursdays will not be the same without these sessions. So uh, it's, it's been very, very fun. Um, but uh, the room is filling up. But as we're waiting, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be querying an external database. Uh, so we're, begin we're going to be using custom coded workflow actions uh, to actually connect and query to an external MySQL database. Uh, and this is a, a very... Um, a common question that I get asked, uh, and hence the reason for the workshop. And uh, I guess rightfully so, because when you think about it, applications and websites behind every good application or website, there is a, a database effectively uh, running in the background. If we look at the CRM that HubSpot offers, that in itself is a database, and that's feeding data into our various hubs, the marketing hub, the, the sales hub, the service hub, the CMS hub. Um, so databases are a critical component of, of really any sort of web-based infrastructure uh, and really any business. And, and today we're going to be looking at how we can actually create a database, connect to it, and work with the data within that database. Um, quick one as well before we start, if, if anyone would like to... Um, uh, if, if anyone would like to just post in the comment, I'm curious to know if you'll be following along in terms of actually practically trying to do each step. Or is the idea that you're going to sit back, relax, listen to what's being presented, um, and maybe take this offline and follow up? I'd just be uh, curious to know how people have approached these uh, these workshops. Okay, so Samantha's going to be following Alon. Uh, listen and observe, Katie. That's perfect. Um, and I'd imagine there's a good mix out there in the audience anyway. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, as always, we'll be sharing the slide deck with all of the steps. We'll be sharing the recording. We'll be sharing the code. And we'll be sharing a ton of resources on the community. So do not worry if you can't follow along or you fall behind or you just want to listen. No problem at all. Uh, we've got you covered in that respect. So I'm going to just uh, back out here now. And hopefully, you'll, you'll be able to see this OK. To, to kind of lay the, 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 the agenda out, um, what we're going to be doing today, first of all, is uh, we're gonna be setting up a HubSpot developer account. If you've attended any of the previous workshops, you've likely done this already. So we can use uh, the, the one that you would have set up previously. We're also being, we're gonna be setting up an account with a service called db4free.net. Um, this will just allow us to host uh, a MySQL database. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it's not overly fancy, but it does the job. And at the end of the day, all we're doing is testing and trying out these things. Uh, in reality, you might have your own provider, um, cloud-based provider or hosting provider that you, you'd manage that database from. But for the purposes of today, db4free.net is a, is a really good service that will, will uh, meet the, the requirements that we have. Um, we're also going to be downloading a tool called MySQL Workbench, which is a, uh, a client that you can use to connect and query and manage your databases in a, in a graphical kind of way. So typically, when you set up these database, databases, You'd be running commands and it can it can be quite uh, intensive. Um, MySQL Workbench is a really nice way of kind of packaging that up in an interface that's easy to use and understand. So we'll be using that to configure the database and query it. And then obviously uh, the final step will be actually creating the workflows to query that database from within HubSpot. So we're gonna be covering a huge amount. Uh, hopefully by the end of the session, you'll be walking away with some great ideas and insights into how all of this works. Um, now, another thing I'd say is, if you haven't already, navigate to developers.hubspot.com and click on the Create a Developer Account button. 
run through uh, the, the uh, series of steps there just to create your own account. And what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. This is a developer uh, account within HubSpot. Uh, there are special types of uh, accounts that allow you to build applications, register applications, manage your marketplace listings, that type of thing. But one of the really uh, interesting components of them is the ability to create test portals. And what you can do in these accounts is you can create up to 10 test portals that for all intents and purposes have uh, enterprise level access to the HubSpot tools and APIs. And uh, they last for 90 days. Uh, so you can create 10 of these uh, enterprise access. They last for 90 days. You can renew them manually at any stage if you'd like to extend that out so you can continue working on your projects. But it provides developers and customers and just people interested in this type of thing with a, a, a sandbox environment uh, effectively to, or a blank canvas rather, to, to, to work and try out all the HubSpot functionality and the APIs that we offer. So that's an important step because that's where we're going to be building our, our, our workflows today. Uh, you can see I have one created there. I'm going to create another one in, in a moment. What we're also going to do is we're going to navigate to db4free.net. It's not the prettiest of sites, excuse the very 90s uh, <laughs> layout. But as I said, this service does the job. Uh, there's not a whole lot of services that offer true free access to host databases. There is, of course, uh, AWS, which has a freemium model, um, but credit cards are required and you know, you can actually uh, go into that premium tier without realizing if you haven't set alerts and that type of thing. So I wanted to avoid all of that and make sure that we're just operating from a nice, simple, clean tool that does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, so if you navigate to db4free.net and sign up, um, that will give you uh, an account that we'll be using uh, a little bit later on. Uh, I'll be coming back to this, so don't worry. Um, what we're also going to be doing is we're going to be downloading MySQL Workbench. This is the tool that we'll be able to use to connect and, and query our database and, and configure our database accordingly. Again, it's a free tool. It's the official client for managing um, databases, MySQL databases. If you think of what Chrome is to accessing websites, MySQL is that to accessing databases. Uh, it's a very similar tool in that set. You connect to a database and you can run commands. Uh, and then once we have all of this in place, what we're going to then be doing is building out some workflows. So we're going to build out two types of workflows. Example one is going to focus on connecting and querying the database. It is going to run any time a contact is created. It's going to query that database to see if they exist. And if they, do, if they don't exist, it will add them to that database. What it's also going to do is pass back some information to the workflow to tell us if they exist or not. And based on that, we can send them down different pathways. So the idea here is that if you know, you're offering free trials or you maybe have things where people are signing up regularly and you wanna check if they're customers or that type of thing, basically you'll be able to query a database and send them down the different pathway depending on the status that they have. Uh, we'll also be doing this with Python. So you can build custom coded actions with JavaScript in a node run runtime environment, or you can build them in Python. It's really just a matter of preference. Both will do exactly the same thing, but for consistency and full transparency, I wanted to include examples of both. And then the second uh, workflow that we're gonna be building is an interesting one. And again, another feature of Operations Hub, it's actually a scheduled workflow. So the workflows before will execute when something happens, as and when contacts are created or if someone fills in a form. These workflows on the other hand are set up to actually operate at a specific cadence. So you can see here, we can choose a schedule and run it at a given time of day or a given day of the week or whatever the case may be. So these can be really, really interesting uh, to set up if you want to run maybe a daily job to uh, query an external system and make sure that the data is in check and pass data back and forth between HubSpot and said system. Uh, and again, we'll be doing that in both uh, Node and Python. And worth noting as well, all of the code sa uh, samples that you see today, as we go through it, they're all accessible here. So I think my colleague Yana will be sharing this in the chat, but as we go through the tutorial today, all of the code that you actually need is accessible here and can be copied and pasted. And what I've done as well ahead of time is I've done my best to comment each line of that code to describe what it's doing. I appreciate there can be a lot, of, a lot to take in and a lot of learning involved, but um, I wanted to make it as easy as possible to digest. Uh, so with that all said and done, we will get started. So what I'm going to do is navigate to the developer website, create that developer account. 
I've done that already. So here we are. And I'm going to click on create app test account. And I'm just going to call mine workshop number four and create. And I can then immediately click into this account. And you'll see now what I have is a HubSpot environment that I can work within. There's no data in the environment. It's a blank canvas, but it's a place that I can work with and, and try out the APIs, try out the various tools, um, and really get to grips with the tool. What we also need to do is we need to go to db4free.net. Now, I can't do this step again because I've already done it, but I'll walk you through exactly what I did. Um, if you click on the sign up option here, it's going to ask you for some details to sign up. Now, what I would say is this is, and it's all stated here, it's a testing environment. This is by no means what you would build a full-scale application on. It's simply a way for us to create a database in the cloud that we can play around with and query and see all of the mechanics working. Um, now, what we will need to do is provide a name for our database. What I'd recommend you do is just use your the, the first letter of your first name and then your surname. Uh, username, I would recommend doing the exact same thing. And then obviously your user password is up to you what you'd like to use. And then just make sure you add either your personal or work email address, completely up to you, uh, and sign up. Now, what you'll get off the back of signing up to this is an email that looks something like this. That's a little bit hard to see. I appreciate it, so I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, there we go. Uh, now, there's a lot of data in here. It just says what the, the tool is, et cetera. But it includes some interesting things as well that we need to take note of. So first of all, up here that I'm highlighting, it's giving us the host name of the server that we're going to connect to. That's where our database lives, db4free.net. It's giving us the port number that we're going to use to connect, which is 3306. Uh, and it's also giving us a confirmation link that we have to click to confirm our account. So what I would say at this point is make note of this up here and click on that link. And that is really all there is to that step. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to download MySQL Workbench. So you can click on download now and you can choose your operating system. I'm on Mac. Um, some of you are probably on Windows out there. Um, and it's really just a question of downloading it. Now, it may take a, a bit of time. So I'm going to pause for a second to let people go through this if they are following along. But when MySQL Workbench is downloaded, what we will be able to do, and I'll pull it into view here, is we will have something that looks like this that we can, we can open up on our, our desktop. Um, and we're going to be using this to actually connect to the database that we just configured in db4free.net. Um, now, I will just say here, there's some really useful things about MySQL Workbench that are worth noting is that you can actually save connections. So you can see I have one already saved, ready to go. So if I double click, it will open up. And you can do this basically just by clicking on the plus icon. And you can configure your connection so that you don't have to continuously be, be import, inputting details if you want to connect and try something or check something. So that's one of the really uh, nice things about uh, MySQL Workbench. Not to mention, in a moment when we log in, it's got a ton of other functionality that we can utilize. Now, for anyone who is setting up MySQL Workbench, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be putting in, um, just to go back, we're going to be clicking on the plus icon. And we're going to be configuring a connection to the database that we just provisioned. So you can call your database whatever you like. Uh, you might just call it, I'll just call it Jack's database. This is just a name that makes sense to you that will be displayed in the interface of MySQL Workbench. The host name and the port number, if you remember from that email I referenced earlier on, is, uh, where is it here? It's db4free.net, I believe, just to make sure, db4free.net. So I'm just going to put in db for free.net. The port number is 3306. That is a default port number, so we won't have to override that. Uh, and the username that we're going to use is whatever you signed up for that db4free.net website with. So in my case, it was Jay Caldrick. Now, what you can do at this point is you can test the connection. So if I click test, you'll actually see that I've successfully made a connection to the database. So all of that is working. Um, you may be being prompted to specify your password. There's nothing wrong with that. That's entirely normal, in which case you'll be using your password that you would have uh, signed up for the service with. But so long as you're getting a successful response here, that means that your credentials are correct, your database is there, and your um, MySQL My Workbench is talking to it. 
And once we've got that all done, all we need to do is click OK. And you'll see there off the back of that now, I've got two options. I've got Jack's database and my database. So you can do this as many times as you like to connect with various other uh, database providers um, um, and, and services that you're using, uh, but it's a really nice way to, to manage all of this. Now, what I'll do here is I'm gonna click on my connection from earlier on, and you'll see that it's opening up an editor here. So what we're, what we're looking at here now is a tool where we can actually begin to work with the database. Um, so you'll see here, uh, you should have nothing showing up. Um, but what we're able to do here is we can put in our SQL statements, which are ways to manage and modify the database. So MySQL is what's called known as a relational database. Uh, and it's basically a series of tables that contain information relating to your customers, their orders, um, you know, it could be apples, bananas, or oranges, it doesn't matter. But relational databases are structured in such a way that you have tables with rows of data, you have columns that describe the types of data within those tables, and the tables are connected to each other. Um, and that's where the relational piece comes in. So you might have a table of customers linked to a table of orders, for example. And all of this data is structured in such a way that you can easily query and manage it. So MySQL Workbench will give us the platform by which we can actually create those tables and query the database to make sure everything is okay. So the panel here in the center here is where we're gonna be placing our SQL statements in a moment. Um, you'll also see there's a couple of options up here. The ones we're gonna be using today really are the two little lightning bolt symbols you see there. Um, the first one will just execute the entire statement that we paste in. The second one is used if you highlight a block of that statement and you want to execute it, and you'll see that in action in a moment. Now, in order to actually uh, start doing anything here, what I'd recommend everybody does is navigate to the code that I think Jan would have shared in the chat. And if you scroll down to, um, if we scroll down to this uh, Operations Hub Workshop for SQL, so there's a whole load of code there, and we can just basically copy and paste all of that and paste it in there. And you should have something that looks like this. Now, let's just talk about what we're looking at here um, to kind of familiarize ourselves. So if we start at the top, and I see if I can zoom in at all here, I'm conscious that maybe uh, I think I can. Hopefully, that's clear to see. Apologies if there's any problems there. Um, but what we're looking at here, uh, if we start from the top is a series of SQL statements or commands. So the very first thing you'd wanna do here is replace your database name with whatever your database is called. So in my case, my database was called J. Kuldrick. Um, this could be anything. We also have other commands here that are gonna create some tables in our database. So you can see I have one here to create a table called customer info. And within this table, I'll have a, a column that is the customer's ID. That's a unique key that's incremented each time something's added to the database. I'm also going to have their first name, which is a, just a string of text. It can be up to 205 characters long. I'll have their last name, again, 205 characters long. And I'll have their email address, 205 characters long. And every table you create in MySQL has to have a primary key, a unique identifier. Just like with HubSpot, the unique identifier of a contact is their, their contact ID or their email address. The same goes with a relational database. The unique identifier in this instance is the customer ID that's being incremented and auto-assigned every time a new row is added. We're also gonna be creating another table here uh, for order information. Uh, and it's gonna be quite similar in structure. We're gonna have an order ID that will be incremented. We've got the name of the order. We've got the amount that's gonna hold a currency. So it can, we're storing a decimal value. We'll store 15 figures before the decimal and two after. So it should correlate to really whatever values of, or orders we're working within. Uh, and we're also gonna be storing a date uh, because we wanna store maybe the, the date at which that order was, was closed. And again, the unique identifier is the ID, the order ID of the, of, of the, row, of the record. There's also a couple of commands down here. Uh, that you'll see where we can actually select uh, information from the table. So you can see here I can select everything from the customer info database. And I'm just conscious that there's a line missing. So apologies, I'll, I'll add that up. But we can also add a line here to select 
and then add an asterisk, all from order info. So we've got two select statements, and these are used to actually query our database. What we're doing is we're selecting. The asterisk is basically saying everything from this table, and it will return the information in that table. You can get much more granular with SQL, and you can say, uh, let's pull everything where the email is equal to X, Y, or Z, or where the first name is Jack and their favorite color is blue or whatever the case may be. Um, we're not gonna be doing that today, but it is just worth noting that with my MySQL, you can actually do that if you'd like. So if you have all of this code here ready to go, what you should be able to do is just click on the lightning bolt, okay? Now I've done this already. So yeah, you'll see that the table already exists. So I'm not able to, but you should see uh, something uh, being output here in this little panel. And if you've done that uh, successfully, that means that your tables have been created. And what you can actually do then is to make sure they've been created is you can come down here and you can highlight line 37 and click on the little other, uh, the, the, the Thunderbolt icon with the cursor. And what it should do is it should, you'll see here, it's just pulled up some results. Now it's very small, apologies. Uh, there's nothing I can do to zoom in there, but what we're looking at here basically is a grid of all of the records in the database, or the table rather. Now there's nothing there because we haven't done anything, but you can see the structure there. We've got a column for each piece of information we're storing. And if we do the same thing for order information, we highlight it and click on the little Thunderbolt icon with the cursor, we're getting the order table coming up. Again, nothing is there, but in, in a short time, there will be information there. And what we can do as well when we build out these workflows later on is we can revert back to our My, uh, MySQL workbench and we can actually run these commands and we should see data being added off the back of the workflows running. So the, the, the main thing is, if you've gotten to this point, is that you, you have uh, signed up for db4free.net. You got that email, you confirmed your account, you've downloaded MySQL workbench, you've taken the code that I provided and you've pasted it into the panel. Uh, you've also made sure, because I mistakenly forgot to add line 44 here, select all from order info. Um, and you've basically then run all of this and you've created your tables. And to make sure it's all working, if you highlight any of these select commands, you should be getting something that looks like this. So that, that's all, um, it means our structure, our database is ready to begin accepting data. So what I'm gonna do at this point then, so I'm gonna actually, um, move this to the side, and I'm gonna navigate back to my uh, account that I just set up. So let's actually create the workflows. Now, the first thing we we'll wanna do as well is uh, click on settings, navigate to contact properties, manage contact properties. And we're just gonna create a property and you'll see why in a moment, we're gonna create one called exists. So we'll just choose to save it in contact information we're just gonna call it exists. Click next. And the field type is a single checkbox. Now, the idea is this property is what's gonna hold the value that's returned from the first workflow. So we're gonna to check to see if a contact is already in the database. And if they are, we're gonna update exists to yes or true or, you know, or, or check the box effectively. Um, if not, it will not have a value. And we'll know that this is the first time they've actually uh, uh, come through the, 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 the journey. So that property is just important to set up. Next thing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into automation and workflows. And we're now gonna start building out our workflows here. So I'm gonna create the first workflow. And we're gonna call this workflow, uh, just to be consistent, workflow, oops, workflow number one. And this is gonna be connect and query my SQL database. Okay, and on the left here, we're not gonna use any of these templates. We're gonna choose start from scratch and we have a load of different types of workflows we can set up with work. We're interested in the contact workflows. So we wanna do something every time a contact is created or something happens to a contact in, in the CRM. There's a couple of options here. We're just gonna stick with blank workflow and we're gonna click next. So this will bring us into the workflow editor. We can define our enrollment criteria. That's what has to happen in order for the workflow to trigger. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna click on the orange button, click contact properties and look for create. So anytime a contact is created, this workflow will fire. 
you can see here, you could actually get quite creative and mix and match your, your enrollment uh, triggers or, um, or filters. So you might have it that if someone signs up for on the contact form or a free trial or someone views a certain page or whatever the case may be, you can get quite uh, specific in terms of your enrollment criteria. Um, in this case, we're just keeping it quite broad. A contact is simply being created in the database. So apologies, go back there and create and is known and apply. Oops, done it twice, so I'll remove that. There we go, safe. So we have our enrollment criteria. The next thing that we need to do is we actually need to add our custom coded action. So you'll see here we have a suite of different actions that we can leverage. I'm gonna use the custom coded action. And if you click on that, and I'll be zooming in in a minute, so do not worry, but if you click on that, you'll see something like this. And if we go from top to bottom, what you're gonna be able to do is choose the language that you're gonna be building this uh, action out in, Node or Python. Again, we have code samples for both. We're going to be adding some secrets in a moment. This is so that we can keep things um, private. So you don't necessarily see them within the code, but you can still reference the values. So this is really useful for passwords and usernames and, and the like. We've also got properties that we want to include in the code. So the, the, the information that we want to use within our code. So we want to take the person's email address, their first name and last name and query a database. So we're going to be adding that. We're going to be making sure we copy our code in. And then every custom coded action can give something back to the workflow. So if we scroll down here, you'll see there's data outputs. So we'll be specifying a data output so we can pass information back and update that exist property that we set earlier on. So if we start at the top, we're gonna to create a node workflow action. And actually I can zoom in here actually, hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, we're gonna create a node workflow action and we're gonna create some secrets, okay? So let's click on the drop down and choose add secret. And the first secret we're going to create is my SQL underscore, and it's user, uh, just to make sure I get this right. Uh, I'm referencing my code. Um, so we're going up here. Yeah, these are the names here. So user and password. I just want to make sure I get them right so our code works. So my SQL user, and the secret value in this case is whatever the user uh, name that you signed up for that service with or used to connect to your database is. In case for me, it's Jay Kuldrick, and we save. We're going to create another uh, secret, and we're going to call this my SQL pass. Just make sure again, uh, password, apologies, my SQL password. And what we're going to do here is put in the password that we would have used to sign up for the database. So again, you're not going to usually share this with anyone for the purposes of this. I uh, just used my name. It's not a, a big secret, so I use my name as the password. <laughs> Um, of course, you'd likely have used something differently. Uh, what we're then going to do is we are going to create uh, some other variables for the, the host that we're connecting to. So my SQL host. And this is going to be db4free.net. Again, you'll probably notice this, is, this should be familiar. This is the, the information we would have input into my MySQL workbench. It's the exact same credentials. Uh, we're just placing them in HubSpot so that we can reference them and use them in our code. And then finally, we'll add one more, which is MySQL underscore DB. This is the name of the database we're going to connect to. So I call my database J. Coldrick. So I've added my secrets and they're ready to be used in the code. The next thing I need to do is add my input variables. So I'm going to choose my properties. I'd like to use the contact's first name. I'd like to use the contact's last name. And I'd like to use the contact's email address. So this is the information we're going to be passing into our custom coded work collection so that we can leverage it and query the database. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this on full screen. It's a little bit easier to see. I'm going to make it, whoops, apologies. I'm going to make it dark so I can actually see the contrast. I find that easier to, to read. Uh, and I'm going to navigate back to my code snippets. And I'm going to look for example one JS. And I'm going to just take everything from line one right down to line number 63 and take that and i'm going to copy it in here so i can highlight everything delete it we don't need it and we're pasting in the code from the uh, repository that was shared so this is our code responsible for connecting and querying the database <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll run through this shortly as to what it's doing but before we do that one final thing if we scroll down as well to data outputs we're going to add an output the data type, we're going to set it to a Boolean, so a true or false value, and it's going to be result found. 
And you'll see here, this actually correlates to our code here on line 58, what we're, we're defining in our output fields. So we're basically telling the workflow what type of data this is so that we can pass it to the respective property. And to make sure I don't lose anything, I'm gonna save this uh, so nothing disappears on me. I'd encourage you to do the same. It'll probably close when I save it, I'll open it up again. Um, and let's take a look at what all of this is doing. So full screen, dark mode, and let's zoom in. Hopefully that is clear to see. So if we start from the top, what we have here is some JavaScript. And what we're doing here on line number six is we're importing uh, the MySQL node library, which is a way, which is a, a, a special library that has a load of different pieces of functionality that uh, you can use in your code to connect and query uh, a MySQL workbench or a MySQL database rather. Apologies. It's worth noting that the same things we would have done in MySQL Workbench, we can do within our code here. So just like we were selecting data from the database tables to see what was there, uh, we're going to be doing something similar here to check to see if records exist. So the MySQL library gives us the, the, the functionality we need in our code to do just that. On line number nine, what we actually have then is a function. And everything within this function is what's executed when we get to the custom coded action. Line 11 through to line 15, we're defining some variables. Variables just hold information. You can see here line 12, we're holding the user's email, the input field. We're also holding the first name and the last name of the contact in the workflow. And I've also created some variables that I'll reference later on. Um, I've created at the top of my code just for um, efficiency. So from 17 down to 23 then, what we're doing is we're configuring our connection to the database. So we're using that MySQL library that we would have imported at the very, very top, and we're creating a connection. And you can see that connection needs a host name, a username, a password, and a database. So just like MySQL Workbench, where we had to put in our host name, our username, and our password, and then use a specific database, the same is true for our code. So what we're actually doing in this instance is we're going to be referencing our secrets um, that we added just a moment ago. So they're not visible in the code, but the code certainly can reference those values. Then from line 25 onwards, we're actually going to query the database. So now that we've established a connection and hopefully there's no errors, line 28 would throw an error if there was, all going to plan, we're now ready to query the database. So you'll see here what I'm doing is I'm running another um, uh, statement here and I'm saying, let's get everything from the customer info table where the email address matches the contact enrolled in this workflow's email address. And then what I can do is I can say, right, well, if some data is returned, well, then we obviously know that there is a record there that came back. So the contact does exist, in which case I set results found true. Otherwise, we can assume there is no record for that individual. So what we're going to do is we're going to add one. So you can see here now we have a slightly different statement. We're going to insert into our customer info table, and we're going to update the first name, the last name, and the email address with the values of the first name of the contact, the last name of the contact, and their email address. And we're going to update results found to false because we're going to tell the workflow they weren't there. So they are a new customer, let's say. And again, we've got some uh, statements here to see if there's any errors. There should not be, uh, so, so don't worry. Then finally, we end the connection, and then we pass back the results found to the, the output fields uh, JSON object to the workflow. So. A lot there, but assuming all has gone to plan here, okay, what I'm going to do is if I scroll down here and test the action and I choose one of these contacts, I'll just choose uh, Brian Halligan as an example and click test. All going to plan, we should hopefully get back. Yep, it's actually worked. That's brilliant. We'll get back in, uh, something that looks like this. You can see results found is false because he did not exist, and that's perfect. If I navigate back to MySQL Workbench, I'm going to just make this a bit smaller for a moment. I'm gonna pull this into view. I'm back in my SQL workbench. You'll see here, I know it's, it is hard to see, so apologies. Um, but at the very least, if you can see, there's nothing here. If I refresh this table, you'll see now we actually have a record here for Brian. So he's been added to the database. And interestingly, if we take that out of the way again, if we try to enroll him again into this workflow, so let's, let's test again, let's see what happens. You'll actually see this time results found is true. So we query the database and there was a result for Brian. In that case, we've passed back the information to the workflow to say he does exist. Uh, and I've added some console.log statements for debugging purposes, just a nice thing to do. So we can see this is information coming back from that database. 
So what we've done here is we have built a custom coded workflow action that connects and queries uh, a MySQL work, uh, uh, database. Uh, and we've done that with JavaScript. The finishing touches to this workflow, if we save it, is we need to then add our copy action. So we need to scroll down here and we want to say copy property value. And we want to copy from the result. So the custom code action that result found, we want to copy it into the exists field. So it's either going to be true or false, checked or unchecked. And then what we could do if we'd like is we can add an if then branch. We can branch based on that logic. So we can basically say for contacts, we could say exists. And we'll look for exists. And if it exists, so if, if it does exist, they exist, great. Otherwise, uh, we'll scroll down and we'll say uh, does not exist and save. And what we actually have here now is a, a check to say, well, if they exist, go down this way. If they don't exist, go down that way. And then we can obviously add more actions, could add another custom coded action potentially to do other types of things. So uh, that is the example using JavaScript. Um, the the uh, example using Python is very much the same. The only difference is the code that we're adding. So if you don't mind for one moment, I'm zooming out just so I can navigate easier. I'm going to clone my workflow and I'm going to call it workflow number two. And I'm just going to say, this is the Python example and submit. So I'm just kind of taking a shortcut here. Um, so cutting corners, but useful to see how you can clone workflows and that type of thing. So in a moment, we should have another workflow here, structurally the exact same, nothing changes. All we're interested about is changing the custom coded action. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna navigate back to my code repository. I'm going to take my Python code here, uh, control, uh, command C or control C, jump back to the workflow, click on custom code, and I'm gonna change the language from node to Python. I've already got my secrets. I've got my input fields. I have my data output already because we've cloned it. And I'm just gonna replace all of this with my code. And I'm gonna set that to dark and make it full screen. And I'm gonna zoom in and just very uh, quickly run through what's happening here. So just like the JavaScript code, we're importing libraries at the top. Um, Python, most languages will have uh, packages and libraries to interact with databases. They have a MySQL package, so we can use that to connect to the database. Line number nine is the function that's gonna execute. We're doing, what we're doing here is we're storing the input variables in properties. So the email, first name, and last name that we'll query the database with. We're then connecting to the database and we're getting those secrets again in a slightly different manner, albeit, because it's a different programming language. There's different ways to do things, but we're configuring our, my, our, our connection to the database. And then the way you query MySQL databases with Python is that you define what's known as a cursor. And a cursor lets you uh, uh, execute uh, SQL commands, SQL commands. So you can see here on line 26, I'm selecting everything from the customer information table where the email address is equal to, and you'll see there's this kind of strange symbol here, percentage and an, an S. Um, so this is a, a, an interesting thing to keep note of is it's a way of preventing what's known as um, my, uh, uh, MySQL or SQL injection. So you can imagine if somebody was to come to your website and put in a command to interact with the database in the input field, that actually could do a lot of damage if the server took that and executed that command. So there are bad actors out there who will try to do that type of thing. Python has a nice way whereby it will actually strip characters. So that doesn't happen. And this is the way you can do it. So what we're doing here basically is we're substituting what we see here with what's on line 27. So we're taking that user's email and we're putting in a, a, a formatted safe version into our statement. Then we're just simply executing our command we're, see, we're getting all of the results. Uh, for debugging purposes, we make sure that we're, we're getting something back. And similar to the JavaScript, if we get back a result, well, we know that there's something there, so we set it to true. If we don't get back anything, we know that there isn't a record there, so we're gonna add that record in, and then we pass the data back to the workflow. And if we actually do this now, if I go down here and I say, let's pretend we're Maria Johnson this time and I test it, what we should hopefully see this time is uh, some, I'll go into plan, we should see, yep. You can see that she didn't exist, so we got false back. You can see the console said there's no results found. That's brilliant. So if we actually go to the workbench now, 
And if I refresh the rows, you can see another record's been added. And again, apologies for the very small text. It's, there probably is a way to do it, and I just don't know. So uh, apologies for that. But a new row has been added. And to verify that, if we go back here and we try to test again as Maria Johnson, what we should be getting back now is that she does exist. So you see that true this time, a result was found. And there is the information that's come back relating to Maria Johnson. So what we've done here is we've created two workflows, one using JavaScript, one using Python, both functionally doing the same thing, connecting to an external database, checking to see if a record exists. And if a record does not exist, it's adding a record to that, uh, to that uh, table. So if you've gotten that far, uh, massive congratulations, because that, that's, that's, a, that's an impressive thing to do, especially if maybe you're new to coding or you've, this is kind of a, a new territory that you're looking to expand your skills in. Um, that goes through a lot of mechanisms and functionality that can be very useful for various other uh, uh, projects you might be working on. And I appreciate as well, there's a lot to take in, uh, but rest assured the recording, the code snippets and the deck that we'll include will have all of the steps as well. So for anyone who's maybe struggling to keep up, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, it's just, there's a lot to cram in in a very short space of time. So that is our first workflow, our first example done. The next one we're gonna create is a scheduled workflow. So what I'm gonna do, so just for, it's a little easier for me to see. Again, I'm gonna zoom out, save that so I don't lose anything. Uh, we're gonna create a brand new workflow. So I'm gonna go back to the workflows. And from within here, I'm gonna click create workflow. And from within here, I'm gonna this time choose deal-based workflow because we wanna do it for deals this time. And I'm gonna choose schedule. So this is gonna be a scheduled workflow. Now you can see we can run it at a specific cadence. I wanna do this every day at a specific time, Eastern Seaboard time. So let's say six in the morning, this job is gonna run. I'm gonna call this workflow number three. And I'm gonna say sync order data to database or something like that. Let's click next. Now, the way these work is that the deal meets the enrollment criteria. So if a deal meets the enrollment criteria, when this schedule comes around, the custom coded workflow action will be executed. So let's imagine I wanted to build an action that will sync uh, closed one deals to an external system. Maybe it's an accounting system or database. Um, so that have closed in the last 24 hours since the job last ran. What I could do is I could say, let's enroll deals that have a closed date that is less than a day ago. So they've closed in the last 24 hours. That's our enrollment criteria. It's scheduled to run at 6 a.m. Eastern Seaboard time. And let's add a custom coded action to, to do something at that time. So just like before, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do Node and Python. First, we're gonna do Node. We're gonna add in our secrets. They should be ready and saved there. So we won't have to go through all that again. We can simply add them. We can add our input fields. So for this, what I'd recommend we do is we use uh, the name of the deal. We use the amount of the deal. And let's just say we want to sync the close date of the deal. Again, you could do as many as you like, whatever data you wanna get out, you can do that. We add whatever input fields we, we like. We don't need to specify any data outputs because we're not doing anything off the back of this. It's all gonna happen in our coded action. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna navigate over to my code, I'm gonna scroll down to example two, JavaScript, and I'm gonna take everything we see here. Now this is, uh, I have to say, um, when I started doing these workshops, I only really started getting much more into Python. I never, I usually was more into the JavaScript side of things. For this workshop, for this specific example, it was much easier and more intuitive to do with Python. So I really saw the value of that. Um, I don't know if anyone feels the same out there, but I found it much more, much easier to do with Python. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, but if we go back to the workflow, I'm gonna go full screen. I'm gonna make that dark again, I'm gonna take away everything and paste it in. So you can see a whole load of code and I'm gonna save it so I don't forget and I'm gonna zoom in. So let's, oops, apologies. Uh, let's just take a look and see what's happening here. So we're tight on time. I wanna get this wrapped up in the next five minutes so we can take questions. But uh, So I might fly through this a little bit quicker, so apologies. But what the code's doing here, again, we're importing our library because we're going to connect. We have our function that's going to execute the code when this workflow action is reached. We're storing some information in variables. 
Uh, and this is interesting. And this is uh, so because if you remember our order information table, we're holding some date information. So the database is expecting a date in a specific format. So what we're actually doing here is HubSpot will give you the date in a Unix timestamp, which is basically just a, a, a long number uh, that a computer understands to be a specific point in time. What we need to do is we need to convert that to a, a format that the database will accept. And that's what we'll be passing in. So that's that's really what's happening here. And if you do use this code, you can actually uncomment all of this and it will show you exactly what we're doing there. And you'll see the date, the, 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 the date changing its format and, and it'll be very uh, obvious to you what's happening. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're basically creating our, our date that we're gonna pass in. So we're gonna pass it in in this fashion, year, month, date, then the hour, the minute, and the second. We then create our connection and then we insert the information into the database. Now I just realized I don't have a deal created. So let me just very, very quickly do that. Um, back to the work, I'm gonna jump out here and I'm gonna go into sales and deals and I'm gonna add a deal. And I'm gonna call this Jack's deal. Okay, let's just call it Jack's deal. And it's going to be for five or five thousand uh, dollars, and it is going to be closed. Let's just choose, I don't know, a day in the future for argument's sake, and let's put it in a closed one stage. Okay, so uh, create so that deal is created. We're going to go jump back to the workflow. I'm going to refresh the workflow so it it updates and it it will be able to reference that deal. Um, and I'm going to jump back into my coded action and make it full screen change it to dark mode again and scroll down. So you'll see here the test action. Let's actually see now what happens if we enroll that deal, okay? So if we take Jack's deal and click test, let's see what we see in the console here. So we can see that it was successful, brilliant. We can see that human readable date and we can see that conversion to the, the, the format the database will understand. And then for debugging, I just output my, my SQL command because I had a few issues getting this set up initially. If I navigate back out to my, or I'll bring it into the workbench, and I choose the select all from order info and click on the little icon here, you'll see that we have our, day, our, our record here. Now, unlike the other examples, um, if you were to test this again, a new, entrant, a new uh, record will be added because we don't have a check this time. This is a job that will be run every day and it's gonna sync deals that were created or closed one in the last 24 hours. But you can see we're adding information there. And then finally, in the last two minutes before we open it up for questions. Um, let's just uh, look at the Python version of that. We'll clone this workflow. Uh, we're gonna call it workflow number four. We're gonna call this Python and click submit. And I'm gonna jump over to my code. I'm gonna take the Python script and let's jump back into the workflow once it loads up for us. All we need to do is change our code. So we're gonna use Python this time. Uh, I'll paste it in there and dark mode and full screen. So what's happening here, much like the same, we're importing the libraries. Uh, we're importing a date time library as well so that we can actually manage the, the date so we can format it correctly. You'll notice as well, this is much shorter than the last code snip we looked at. Uh, Python I found was just easier to work with date time formatting in my opinion. Uh, you'll see that we're storing the input variables and properties. We're converting the, the date that HubSpot gives us to a uh, a format that is going to be understood by the database. We're then making that connection to our database and then we're querying our database. And that's all there is to it. And if we were to then test that action again with Jack Steele and click test, all going to plan, we should get a success coming back. Uh, if it loses this for me now, there we go. We've got success coming back. I wasn't outputting anything, so nothing in the logs, that's fine. And if we go back into the workbench and refresh that table, there's another deal there uh, visible. So to summarize, what we've done now is we, we, from start to finish, we created our developer account, we spun up our test account, we navigated to db4free.net and set up a, a database in the cloud that we could test in. We downloaded, downloaded MySQL Workbench so that we could connect to that database and configure the database and build out the tables. Once they were intact, we navigated back to HubSpot. We built out our workflows that were going to query those database tables and perform actions off the back of that. And we have examples in 
uh, Python and Node to, to complement that. And again, for anybody who maybe was just listening, every single step that you see here is, is documented here, step by step by step by step by step. So you know, don't feel that you have to follow this along. Everything will be in these documents that are sent on to you as well. I've done my best to be as comprehensive as possible. But uh, between this and the recording and the code, uh, you should have all the tools you need. And I will pause now and um, open it up for questions. Thanks, Jack. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, let, let's get into the questions. Uh, quite some came in, and there were also some in the in the chat that I'll uh, try to uh, I will try to get to later on. Um, but the first question um, is references something that was said in the chat. Um, the person says Thomas Lane asked in the chat, uh, but I was curious to the uh, to the answer again, not the original questioner. So the question is, does HubSpot allow you to use placeholders instead of direct inline to the SQL code to be safe from injection attackers? Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, we, we do. Um, what I can do though is I'll certainly, we always do this after our sessions, we follow up with more information. I'll take that offline and, and triple check, but to my knowledge, yes, we do. Security is something that's very important in HubSpot, not just as the company on our own infrastructure and keeping our customers' data safe, but also giving our customers the tools to do things securely and safely as well and follow best practices. So uh, yes is my initial answer. I will triple check that though, and I'll make sure to include it in the follow-up after this session. All right, the next question is by Mark. This example uses a cloud-based MySQL instance. But would there be any complications to consider for an on-premise SQL server instance? Yeah, so I suppose there, there certainly would be, to be quite honest with you. Um, on-prem can be uh, difficult at times to integrate. Uh, it's not uncommon, for example, for me to get asked, can we integrate with an on-prem uh, exchange server instance of Dynamics or something like that? And uh, they are more difficult. Uh, what you need to do is you need to make sure that uh, that, that, that server is accessible to external traffic, whether the IP needs to be whitelisted so it can access it. That's probably the, the, the most basic of things that has to happen. Um, because if that doesn't happen, the, the connection just isn't going to, to go through. Uh, from, from the HubSpot workflow actions perspective or indeed any application on the internet, it, it just won't be able to see that, 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 uh, that, that host machine. Uh, so whitelisting IPs so that you can actually establish a connection is probably the most important thing you'd be doing to make sure uh, that you can access it. Yeah, and, and to kind of add to that, um, because I, I remember seeing a similar question in our community, I think a couple of months ago, um, because I think, and, and you can probably correct me, uh, Jack, but because HubSpot uses AWS servers, there isn't like a fixed IP. So, there need, so if you were to whitelist uh, an IP, it would need to be an IP range, which yeah, might have make make it a bit more difficult um, that, to set that up. That's a good point as well. Yeah. Um, so you, so we certainly we would use dynamic ranges of IPs that are likely to change over time. So that that can create some added complexity. Again, it's not impossible, but certainly is not as easy as if it was a cloud based system that we're connecting to. All right. The next question is by by Eric. Uh, when copying the SQL result in the workflow to a property. Will a uh, true false copy over to yes, no? Uh, so actually, it, it, it won't. It will actually just convert. Well, if it was a drop down and enumeration field, yes, it would. True is yes, false is no. We used a single uh, line, a single checkbox. So checked is true, unchecked is false. All right. Uh, one other question here um, Is HubSpot ever going to allow? Um, C hash as a language. I'm not sure if it's called uh, C, C, C sharp. I think C sharp. Uh, yeah. It's truthfully, I don't know. Um, we recently opened up support for Python. Uh, I know the plan is to expand on this and make it more accessible for everybody, so you can use the language of choice. Let me check that. Uh, something I can take offline, speak to the team about, and I'll make sure to follow up uh, um, on the community post with the resources. As I just truthfully don't know, but I'd like to think that we would be. <laughs> All right, one question by Kimberly. And do you have to upgrade to Operations Sub Pro in order to use custom code in workflows? So for custom code, yes, Operations Sub Pro would be a, a, a requirement. 
uh, for this workshop, you're free to set up a test account. There's no charges there and it's easy and free to do. But if you're wanting to do this in your actual HubSpot account, you realistically need to be looking at shifting over to Operations Hub Pro. That'll give you access to the custom coded automation along with data formatting actions to keep your data clean and tidy um, and the scheduled workflows uh, as well that we looked at. So there's, there's a lot in there, but it would require Operations Hub Professional at the very least. Okay, one question by Lewis. Um, Ruby on Rails uses active records to, to query SQL with simple commands. You don't, have, you don't have to write raw SQL. Is there something in Node.js you can use to not use write the raw uh, SQL for querying the database? There, there most certainly is. Uh, for the purposes of this, I guess I just wanted to keep it. So it was a fine line between uh, efficiency, but also making it understandable as to what's happening. Um, so there are ways to do it, but I chose to actually use the actual SQL statements purely because I, I was conscious there's people on this call that maybe had never been, had never seen a database before, or didn't know what SQL was. So uh, I just figured it would be a bit more descriptive as to what was happening. There's a couple of questions by, by Thomas. Um, the first question is, when I attempted to go through the first workshop, Clearbit, uh, did, they didn't give me the options needed that were displayed in the video. Instead, I only got the two basic options and none of the API functions. Is there a way to get those? Um, there most certainly should be. Um, let me, if it's OK, I, I will follow up. I promise you I will after this call to make sure that uh, you do have the appropriate level of access. Uh, it should be a question that you can sign up for a free account with Clearbit, and it would give you some level of access to their APIs. It is likely that their interface has changed since we last recorded the video, which is something outside of my control, but let me, I, I just haven't checked. So let me check that, confirm it, and I'll be sure to follow it up in the resource post as well. Okay, uh, the second question, uh, what type was used to create the Boolean property on HubSpot's end? It was a single checkbox. All right, and then the third question, how can you force a, a force a cache reset on HubSpot to get set property to show up in the workflows? And if I recall correctly, um, Thomas had some issues, I think, uh, populating some of his custom properties. The, so there isn't a way to actually reset the cache except for actually refreshing the screen. Um, to be honest with you, if you're noticing any inconsistencies in the interface of the UI, the the best thing to do is simply just do a, a refresh of the page. That should fix 99.9% .9 of the problems. At least from my experience, I haven't seen anything uh, that would go against that. Okay, I think this is the last question in the Q&A, but of course, uh, if, if people have any other questions, you can put them in uh, now. And the last question is, um, will this work well with cPanel, PagePay, uh, PagePay, my admin? It actually will. In fact, that would be the preferred option. Um, cPanel is a nice interface for managing your, your servers and doing various things like creating MySQL databases and various other things. So absolutely, uh, the, if you're happy to set a database up through cPanel, the, the custom coded actions we use today will work just the same. Uh, the, again, the reason I went down this route was because I was conscious that people might not have websites or servers there to work with, and they might not feel comfortable. They might need to work with their IT team on that one. And I just wanted to get a service that was free and easy and quick to use. So certainly cPanel would be the way to go, but uh, it was just a, a choice that I had to make at the end of the day for this session. All right, there was one last question that quickly came in. Um, are we locked into MySQL or does uh, post SQL and again, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, work also for uh, transactions. So PostgreSQL, to my knowledge, no. Um, unless you've got some, uh, unless you can make rest, uh, requests to an external API that would actually translate those queries from HubSpot and query that database. Because right now, uh, and to my knowledge, again, I have a lot of follow-ups for me this week, but um, I don't think there's a, pre, a, a library that we have that supports it at the moment. It could be wrong. Um, I know as well, if you prefer, there is also no uh, SQL databases like Mongo, for example, that you could use. We, we do support using uh, Mongoose uh, to connect to that. Um, but yeah, looking at the libraries here, to my knowledge, Postgre, uh, you, you'll probably struggle with for now. So, uh, but that's worth 
that's that's good feedback to pass back to the team nonetheless. Right, and I'm afraid we I won't have any time to scroll through the chat and and see if there's any uh, questions that I missed. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll hand it over to to Jack to uh, close this off. Um, yeah, well, really, to be honest with you, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for everyone who has joined today, and indeed for anyone who's joined the other sessions that we did. It's been a really intense month. Uh, we did a workshop a week. It's been really fun. It's it's definitely pushed me outside of my comfort zone. It's been a pleasure to come here and present to you all. Uh, I hope that you found them useful. Um, I've done my best to be as comprehensive as possible. And at the very least, I hope you're leaving with maybe a little bit more knowledge than you had when you joined. And I say it every week and I'm more than happy to, if anyone wants to connect, please do so on LinkedIn with me. I'd love to get your thoughts or any feedback you had on the sessions um, and pick up the conversation there. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. And until the next time we run this, uh, happy coding. <laughs>